The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to the short game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined this week by my number one problem. It's me. Hi. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm just joking. Actually, this week, my number one problem is COVID. Um, not my problem. Uh, we were going to do a uh, we we're going to do an episode the on problem. It's the podcast problem. We were going to do an episode on um, um, uh, Fall of Porcupine, which is still coming up, but we have delayed it because uh, Nate is uh, down with the sickness. So uh, sorry, Nate, and hope you feel better hey, soon. Nate. Yep. Hey, Nate. Yeah, well. Um, but we uh, we needed a quick filler, so that's what we are here today. We're talking quick filler. But actually, filler. Uh, no we had a lot of stuff to say, so this seemed like a good yeah. time for us to do a quick wrap-up of uh, just Apple gaming topics. Uh, I know a lot of all of us on the show are Apple device users, Mac users, iPhone users, um, uh, on and off subscribers to Apple Arcade, and uh, there's been a surprising lot of stuff happening in the sort of Apple gaming sphere, such as it is over the last few months. Yeah. And so we thought we might, you know, round up some of that stuff. First, we'll talk a little bit about some of the latest Apple Arcade releases. Uh, and then um, we've got some other stuff to talk about, too. Um, well, I, I think it's we've got a lot to talk about here, taking the perspective of Apple walled garden hostages. Uh, you know, we're, let us we're out. both of us people who for the most part, have used Macs much more than uh, PCs. And um, there's a lot of Apple stuff going on, like it used to be, that my Apple life and my gaming life had absolutely nothing to do with each other. But now we've got things like Apple Arcade. Uh, there's new hardware that seems gaming adjacent, like the Apple Vision Pro. And there's a lot yeah, of really little talk about bits that. of news, um, like the uh, this porting tool toolkit for for gaming on the mac there's some interesting things happening around that so many different things we we have in the past even done episodes on the apple device uh, apple design award winners the adas um which is sort of gaming awards for mac it's like the off-brand gaming awards so anyway let's let's start off with apple arcade uh there's a lot yeah. to talk about yeah, I, I just sort of went through the list of Apple Arcade games released in the last year because we did another we did an Apple Arcade episode roughly a year ago. I mean, actually, we've done two, I think. Um, our last one was about a year ago and we talked about things that had come to Apple Arcade and looking over the list of, you know, Apple has continued to m mostly without fanfare add three to four games a month to Apple Arcade for the entire time. Um, and, uh, not all of them are, you know, that exciting, but looking over the list of games that have come to Apple arcade in the last year or so, it's gotten quite extensive. Um, and so I thought it might be worth just sort of going down the list here and talking about some of the things that are currently on Apple arcade that either we've covered before on the short game or have something to say about as, you know, whether it's a you know short game type of game or whatever. Um, one thing I would start with though, is that this week they announced, uh, three games coming to Apple Arcade, actually five games coming to Apple Arcade very soon, um, coming like in this month. Uh, and some of them are pretty heavy hitters. Ridiculous Fishing EX is coming. And this is a total rebuild of Ridiculous Fishing from Vlambeer. Um, Ridiculous Fishing is a really kind of famous iOS game. It, it was pretty early on the store and it hasn't been available on iOS in years. Uh, for a long time, it was kind of there, but broken on modern devices because it just was in a state where it couldn't be brought up to, to work well on modern things. For example, like all the scaling was off and it affected the gameplay in really terrible ways and made the game basically unplayable. Um, but uh, Vlambeer, the original team, has brought it back and they've redone it in 3D. Uh, it looks really, really cool. Uh, and I'm re I can't wait to be able to play uh, this game again at all, and, and in a new and improved version. I'm, I'm, you know, really excited to check it out. Shane, did you play Ridiculous Fishing back when it was, you know, au courant? No, uh, that one missed me, but uh, I, I think it was going around a lot, and I saw a lot of like people's, I don't know, gifs and stuff of it. But you know, no, it, 
there's a lot of great early iOS gaming that I kind of missed because I had certain things that I just played a million hours of and then nothing else could break through. Yeah, no, I definitely have that feeling too. In fact, I was just thinking about it the other day. Like I saw a game on the app store when I was scrolling through for this and I was looking to, you know, to download some of the recent Apple arcade things. And I saw a game on the app store that was like, had like a mean worm for the icon. And I was like, Oh my God, did they bring back like the, the mega worm game that I played so much on my, um, yeah. Yeah. uh, (laughs) No, totally unrelated worm game. But then I went and redownloaded like super mega worm and played it for like an hour. (laughs) And I don't think I'd played it since like the three GS phone. That game oh, man, still rules, so. even though it barely runs on modern devices. But such a great game! I should uh, I should get that on my son's iPad. It's sick. It's great. Um, anyway, uh, back to ridiculous fishing. Just briefly, this is a game where it's it's sort of this silly over the top arcade game where you start with a guy in a boat. He throws out a line, and um, you uh, you're, you're 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 seeing the. Um, uh, the hook descend through the ocean, through various layers of the ocean. And while it's on its way down, your goal is to avoid hitting fish. Um, because as soon as you hit any fish, you know, you get a bite, it starts pearling back up. But for most points, you want to be able to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So you try to avoid fish on the way down. And then you try to catch as many fish as you possibly can on the way up, moving the uh, the hook uh, left and right, sort of rapidly trying to catch as many fish as you can and collecting like an, an unbelievable number of fish. And then when it gets back to the the surface, the the fishing line gets pulled way hard and the fish all go flying up into the air. And the guy on the boat is uh, holding a shotgun and shooting the fish out of the air. Um, and uh, it's great. It's it's just a very addictive, very fun little arcadey um, score chase kind of game. And they've added some stuff to this new version that's coming out, like like daily challenges and things like that, that I think that could really improve the game. So I'm really, really glad to see that happening. Well, that sounds fun. I, I'll be looking forward to kind of checking that out for the first time. The, the thing about that game, part of the reason it might have missed me is uh, just having seen it played once or twice, I was pretty sure I was like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, that's a thing. It's kind of an arcadey game and, you know, you you do see the thing and and you got it, but um, it's a good one. It's a very good one. So I would recommend it. Yeah, also, um, looking forward to it. You know, uh, incredible game of the show Slay the Spire is coming yep, to Apple Arcade. That's coming. That one I, I've spent a lot of time with. Uh, I, I would say Slay the Spire is a incredible pick. A, one of a few that we can discuss here for Apple Arcade. Um, there are a lot of games that are just big indie game phenomenons, but also the kind of thing people will play on an ongoing basis for years at a time, uh, Mm -hmm. and try to 100% and slay the spire is one of those. And so is, um, the, um, stardew Valley. Both of those are Mm -hmm. coming to Apple arcade, which is, those are both really, really good choices to add. To a service like this yeah i was kind of surprised to see stardew valley on there like, you know obviously yeah. it is on ios but like yeah th- these are the kinds of games that people play forever and they're both these like so it's something that apple arcade's been doing a lot more of is just you know getting like a such and such plus version of a game mm-hmm. there's something i kind of like and don't like like i do like that apple arcade doesn't just get games that are like strictly like brand new ios games when it first came out they really like everything they had was like debuting with the service right um and that was cool but you know it it does feel like a value when it's like oh i've been meaning to play this game on you know playstation for years and here it is on my phone and i can just get it that's great and i i you know i think that's there's a lot of value there one thing i don't like about it from a technical standpoint is that when they do bring games that are on the store in some existing form, whether it's like a free to play game or something like Stardew Valley, where it's got like a premium price point and they bring it to Apple Arcade, it's n- they bring it with a totally separate app and a totally separate like store listing. Um, so like star- and then they're like Stardew Valley Plus or Slay the Spires Plus. And what that means is that your save is isolated in that version. So like right. if I you know, if I subscribe to Apple Arcade, I try Stardew Valley out for a month and I like it enough, but I don't like it enough. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know, walled garden. Like, but it, it's it's something that I do find a little annoying about the entire model of, the, of the, these sorts of services in general. The other part of that, though, is the other part of that is that when you see that they have a, you know, Apple Arcade Plus version of one of these games, you also know that they have put at least some time into making sure that this is going to work well on a touchscreen, which not a lot, you know, you you can have some really unpleasant surprises on ports for tablets and phones. The main thing that you get and that you really, I actually very much care about with games like this, I'm willing to make the Apple Arcade trade-off, is that, um, you know, sure, my save file is going to be on the Plus version, but I know that that Plus version is going to have a touchscreen interface that doesn't completely suck. Like the fact that I was able to open up this and play um, Octodad and mm. turns out Octodad will play just fine on an old iPad, even though the controls are terrible intentionally uh, or something like Slay the Spire that's designed for mouse and key. A lot of these games where it's a card game, um, involve a lot of dragging interactions in their PC ports. So if you just take that over to a touch screen, it doesn't always work that well, right? Even Stardew Valley, uh, I haven't played the version of Stardew Valley that's coming to tablets, but Stardew Valley was very much designed for mouse and keyboard, but also kind of cludged on with a controller. Um, so touch screen is kind of different. I don't know what the level of touch screen support it has on things like, I don't know, even the Switch. So I think it's usually worth um, the experience, but there, what do you think? Is there is it enough of an issue for people to want to buy these games separately? I don't know. I think this is like the the, the real pitch for Apple Arcade uh, has become, I think, um, parents. Uh huh. Um, if you're if your kid has an iPhone or an That's iPad true. and they're yeah. bugging you for games, um, this is starting to become a factor for me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and you don't like the like hell stew of of like in app purchase garbage that the app store has become RIP. Um, Apple Arcade is a good way to address that, and they've been bringing a lot of uh, by bringing games like things like Stardew Valley in. Like it just means that like the kid can hit you know get game, and the parent sees that it's free, and they hit OK, yes. and then you're done. So I don't think it's really targeted at me. I think that you're right about that. There's a lot of games that are on Apple Arcade that seem to be very much targeting the younger group. And I think very successfully, um, especially some of the tower defense games. I don't know about your kids. My son immediately fell in love with Balloons TD6, the so tower defense game where monkeys throw darts at balloons. Um, total hit. And it's a great That's cool. game. I have that for free. I got that for free on Epic a while ago, and I hadn't even opened it. Maybe I should give it a try. It's totally great. It's on Apple Arcade as well. Um, it's on everything. I think it would be great to play on PC. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's the sixth ver. Did you play Balloons back when it was like a browser game? Do you remember that? No. Okay, no. so Balloons was like an early Java game where you would um, solve puzzles by having a, a monkey throw a dart to pop all the balloons right and it was you would take so it was kind of um angry birds style kind of controls uh and uh they're like million levels to the browser game and then later on there was a balloons tower defense and now there have been six iterations and now an apple arcade plus i guess it's insane of uh the balloons tower defense and there's the monkeys that you can that you get in this game are insane and there's like, you know, everything from one in a helicopter. There's a full, full monkey um, uh, arm, army and Navy uh, and superheroes <laughs> and wizards and everything. And, uh, you know, and the balloons are still just balloons. <laughs> <laughs> and your and son likes it. Crazy. huh? Oh, he's crazy about it. He loves it. And he's he he has played a, a million hours of it. <laughs> it's, it's the go to. But there's also another. Uh, tower defense game on here that i can recommend which um is the one what is that one called castle crumble battle hard legacy oh man they all have names like that yeah uh it's not any it's not castle crumble 
Kingdom Rush Vengeance TD Plus. That's it. It's Kingdom Rush Vengeance TD Plus. <laughs> I can f- I can totally recommend Kingdom Rush Vengeance TD Plus. Uh, I another think I remember the original like, Kingdom Rush. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was okay. Yeah, this one's this one's good. Uh, It's kind of a you play as the bad guys, uh, but kind of um, heroic fantasy theming. And apart from that, it's just like all the other tower defense games. I was actually going to mention this is so not our bag, but it's also like when I saw this came to Disney Plus, I like nearly jumped out of my skin because I was very excited. Um, Disney has this app called Disney Coloring World, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a like a you know, coloring book app for, for little kids. Um, and it is in its normal version, an absolute, is that nightmare. the one with the little alien guys? No, or There's maybe one on Apple arcade that has little alien pets. I don't that, think uh, so. It, unless, I mean, maybe it does. I won't know. Um, but it's mostly like a coloring book where you color in pictures from Disney movies. And, um, no, but of course one. in the, uh, in the original version, you know, you buy those, those coloring book pages with with daddy's cold currency and uh now it's on disney plus and basically everything is unlocked and i was super psyched because this is something that i knew my daughter would love and we like let her have at it recently and yes as predicted she loves it uh there's a glitter pen and you can color in your various characters and then I guess you can cut them out and put them into little dioramas. And um, she loves it. She's she's spent like two straight hours doing it, which made me feel a little bad as a parent, but also was very <laughs> helpful uh, yes. in my in Sometimes my life at the time at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, there is there are there are whole ass grownups uh, who are buying uh, coloring books. That was, I think, a, a few years ago. All the best sellers were coloring adult coloring books. So, yeah, no, uh, no shade on coloring books. I'll just quickly run down the list of other games on that came out in the last year because within the last year, handful of other games that I thought would mm-hmm. be worth mentioning from a short game games perspective. Um, Getting over it with Bennett Foddy is uh, out on Apple Arcade, which I think is a weird choice because that always struck me as such a weird arty game. Um, I've only ever like poked at it. I, I I think I'd like to put more time into getting over it. And I think maybe on my phone is the way that I'll be able to do that. So I actually was kind of excited to see that that's on there. Um, Limbo classic uh, short game favorite Limbo yep. is on from Play Dead is on Apple Arcade now as of um, May of this year. Um, Shane already mentioned Octodad. That was like the third episode of our show or something like that. If you haven't played Octodad, like we we've talked up a storm about, um, Oh, what's the, what's the game that your kid loved? The, um, the, um, bug um, snacks, bug snacks, of course, uh, that is young horses. Uh, and the, the funniest thing, I think young horses is now he asks every now and then does young horses have another game yet? (laughs) And I'm, sorry yeah. buddy it's gonna be a while it was a It'll long a damn time between octodad I, and i really um, think they need to do a um a, a sequel for um uh, for bug snacks there's just so much more you could do mm-hmm. did, did you end up showing him they released all those weird little prototypes nope i haven't we haven't looked at those yet uh, well, you it. know, when you when you need something for a rainy day, uh, I still haven't looked at them yet either. They they all seemed pretty, pretty charming, though. Um, let's see what else is on this list here. Um, Very Little Nightmares, the weird mobile exclusive spinoff from Little Nightmares. We covered Little Nightmares on the show, but we never covered the sequel. Um, that one is uh, on my to playlist sometime. Um, what the Car came out in May and yeah, sequel is to what the really. Golf. Yeah, it's the so there's actually it's a, the third uh, in the series because there was a what the bat game that was a VR exclusive that I never got around to playing because I don't do VR anymore really. Um, but like what the golf was so incredible and charming what and the bat uh, was a VR Yeah, you never game? saw what the bat is it? What kind of bat is it? A uh, baseball uh, bat. Night, You're, you play or baseball. All right. <laughs> Uh, baseball. You play as someone with baseball bats for hands in VR, which I think is Very actually funny. a really good okay. Uh, okay. really good setup you should you should whip out your uh, your quest and give that one a try i'm pretty sure it's on there i really should um but what the car is fantastic uh i haven't played a lot of it yet but i've played enough to to get a a good taste and 
everything you liked about what the golf, the just sort of like increasing absurdity of it um, mm-hmm. is, is yeah, all there. The car, I've played a little what the car you, it's the icon tells you exactly how weird it's going to get right away, which is a car with legs, mm-hmm. uh, a little smiley car with legs. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you, I played the, the first kind of few stuff. levels of that. The intro of it is hysterical. And I played the first few levels of it with um, my two year old, almost three year old sitting in my lap and looking over at my phone. Um, and he just lost his shit at it. He thought it was the funny when the car grew legs and then it had too many legs and then its legs were too long or it had tiny legs or it had rockets. Every time my, my little boy absolutely lost his shit at it. He thought it was the funniest damn thing. And I, I did not disagree. It was very, very funny. But it was it was like <laughs> it really enhances the experience of playing a game like that to have like a small child in your lap, absolutely losing their shit. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> the, uh, the, it has a, the structure that's a lot more, um, like what the golf had a really almost like RPG ish structure to it, mm-hmm. uh, where there was like a overworld between the golf levels. And so far, maybe I haven't gotten to it yet, but mo- what the car is mostly just wham, bam, joke a second. Like you're going from sequence to sequence to sequence. <laughs> And yeah, it still has kind of a map, but it is definitely like yeah. slimmed down in terms of uh, yeah. F- also, from what I've seen, in terms it 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 a little little more streamlined that's, than I think uh, that's than great. I think it's a good good call. Uh, it's it just takes you in with a title card for each one, and uh, you know it's like too many legs, and you're like okay, now it's too many legs. Let's go, let's go. Um, let's see what else is on the list. Um, Osmos. Uh, I, I want to throw have... out one that we didn't really highlight here. I have a huge complaint for Amalos Interactive, um, creators of Snake.io Plus. Oh, do tell. This is, this is awful. Okay, so have you ever played any of these like .io games? The trend there is like they're the online multiplayer kind of things. I, I feel like I've played one in a browser once or twice, but. Not yeah, really. There was one. There was one called uh, Slither.io. Ah, oh, that's was, the one. Fint was like exactly the same thing. This is that concept exactly, and which is that you know it's a it's snake. There's food everywhere. Um, you can cross over yourself, but if you hit any other snake, you die. Right. So um, I actually really like that kind of game. I find it kind of chill and relaxing, but big point of those kinds of games is getting your name on the leaderboard because there's like a leaderboard for the like 10 longest snakes or whatever. Um, Snake.io has that. Uh, It's got the leaderboard showing, but I'll tell you what, uh, there's not a real person on that game. You're playing against all bots and the names on the leaderboard and everything really make it look like you're not playing against bots, but this game doesn't care if you put that phone on airplane mode. Uh, The same... Those same uh, players are always going to be there. And there's, yeah, this is, it has got fake multiplayer. What? The the, the game's title on the app store is snake.io, fun online slither. Yeah, uh, it is a, it is a knockoff of slither.io, uh, which the original was, was as well. This is not its first time it's been out here. Uh, I, this is the plus version, like you say. But um, yeah, fake multiplayer. There are, I huh. I really experimented with it. I played around with this for for quite a bit. I am like ninety five percent certain that I never saw a real person uh, that's while crazy. playing the game. Huh. And yeah, that makes I it wonder, real easy. I wonder if that's the bots uh, are not smart. I wonder if that's like a um an Apple Arcade versus regular version thing. Like if you're not play if you're only playing in the Apple Arcade kiddie pool. I definitely think that there are other people playing this game um there are a lot of reviews of it on the app store most of them seem genuine and in fact i'm not the only person that's noticed this issue huh. on there uh, but i went to those reviews to check them because i was like nine I, I was increasingly sure that hey i don't think i think i think that all of these random usernames are are bots it's not unusual for a game like this to put some bots in in fact, I think it's healthy to have a few bots in a game like this, but I don't think there are a real, I, I don't think I saw a real person on the whole time. And I played it on Wi-Fi, played that it on sucks. cellular. So yeah. Anyway, that is all. Uh, but yeah, fake as shit. Well, 
Thank you for telling me and warning me off. Um, <laughs> just briefly running down the list a little further. Pocket Card Jockey Ride On is on. But this is probably the, the thing. Much better use I, of your time. That game. Rules. I recently re-upped my my Apple Arcade subscription. Um, and I think the number one thing I'm most excited to put some time into that I haven't yet is to go back into Pocket Card Jockey. Pocket Card Jockey, um, for, for those who aren't in the know, um, was an incredible uh, solitaire meets horse racing game from Game Freak, the creators of Pokemon. And it was on the 3DS as a download exclusive, I believe, mm-hmm. on the 3DS. And you so, and Laura you know, covered it. And I went we back did. and listened to that recently because I, I saw Pocket Card Jockey hit the app store and i remembered how much you guys had said you'd liked it so i checked it out and it's amazing and it turns out that the new version here i think we've talked about it a little bit on the podcast we have at some point but it's okay um but the new version is great this isn't one of those like apple arcade plus releases but it is so far as i know exclusive to apple arcade i'm not totally Mm -hmm. sure pretty sure and um it is a remade version where they've replaced obviously they changed a lot from it being on a 3ds um but the you know there's new 3d graphics for a lot of things including <laughs> 3d <races>. horses <laughs> yeah well it, the, the the art and the graphics work really nicely together and uh the horses are adorable and uh, you want to collect and breed better horses the solitaire is simple and fun and works really nicely with the horse racing. So that's all I've got to say. Good game, really fun. Totally. And yeah, we have a whole episode on it. I think that episode should be valid and stand for, you know, even if you're not hauling your 3DS out, if you want to listen to a couple people yammer about how great Pocket Card Jockey is and uh, all of the details about it, um, go search our backlog. It's in there, but it's way back there because we were talking about the 3ds version. I I really would never have thought I would like a game that was basically timed solitaire, which is what this is. And yeah, no, it takes, it takes a real special game to make me like that experience. Yeah. I mean, we we could talk all day about it, but like it's, it's more than just timed solitaire. They have some very clever tweaks to the standard solitaire formula to make it work to feel faster and to feel more like a race, but it's, um, it is ultimately, yeah, just like (laughs) solitaire with a timer. Um, uh, dead cells is on there. That's pretty cool. Uh, old man's journey is on there. We never did an episode on that, but we almost did. It's very uh, short gamey kind of game. Um, the gardens between we did do an episode on and is on uh, Apple arcade. Um, and I think that's good because it, it would be perfectly fine on a touchscreen and is a pretty brief experience and I think um, would be a, just a great Apple Arcade thing. You know, download it, give it a try. Same thing goes for Gris. That's also had an Apple Arcade release. And I think that's another one that like, you know, if you, maybe you know, that one's got beautiful art. So maybe do uh, an iPad or something if you have access. But um, uh, Shovel Knight Dig is on there. I believe that was that debuted on there. I really wanted to like Shovel Knight Dig, but I didn't. Shane, did you play Shovel Knight Dig at all? No, didn't play it. I love the Shovel Knight games. I love I haven't played all of its various like, you know, reimaginings with the the various other like main characters, but I deeply, deeply loved the original Shovel Knight. And also, um, I forget the title, but the the version with the Plague Knight was also incredible. Uh, I haven't played the other ones with King Knight or whatever else. Um, But I I wanted so badly to like Shovel Knight Dig. You know how much I love digging games, Shane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can dig it. I, I, I was wondering if you were looking at this um, Hello Kitty Island adventure. Very much there. so. Oh, yeah, yes. I'm monitoring out, its release that. quite <laughs> eagerly. <laughs> um, you might. Uh, well, you know why? Good. It's it's uh, it's basically Animal Crossing with Hello with Kitty an, characters. With Sanrio characters. Yeah, which seems like a absolute killer uh, way to make a game. Why not? It's also I, I'm trying to figure this out. There's a there. Do you remember that there's a, a quote from uh, South Park? Do you remember the the Warcraft episode of South Park? No, there's a meme uh, out of that. It's out of that. It's just kind of a scene that gets shared around a lot where uh, the character Butters is like, they're like, Butters, what do you mean you're not playing World of War- Warcraft? You're you're on your computer all the time. And he says, well, but I'm playing Hello Kitty Island Adventure. <laughs> well, that I don't think that game existed until now. Like that 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 name, Hello Kitty what, Island so wait, Adventure. Wait, really? Yeah. So I don't think there was a previous Hello Kitty Island Adventure. I think they took the name from a popular South Park episode throwaway quote that's memed around on the internet for like 20 years. 
That's so funny. Oh, I think weird. I think that's yeah. I'm I'm not totally sure about that. Maybe I need to go to, you know, know your meme or whatever. But that's the thing. Um, well, I don't know. I, I will tell you that, that uh, my my wife somewhere saw that Hello Kitty Island Adventure was coming out. My wife was a uh, is a Sanrio stan and also uh, an Animal Crossing stan and saw that this game was coming out and asked me if she could play it. And I was like, yes, that's oh, you know, I, this, this is not something that happens very often. So um, I'm excited for that to come out. I'm probably going to give it a try. But I, I suspect my wife might like it and maybe my daughter would, too, um, mm-hmm. if it doesn't require too much reading. That's a problem with the uh, the Animal Crossing yeah. games. Like, I think they have kid appeal, but you really do need to be a reader. Yeah. Uh, well, those Sanrio characters don't say a lot. Um, I think if you like if you want games for, uh, you know, Julia, my wife, and our son played all of Love You to Bits, which is on oh, yeah. uh, on Apple Arcade. They played, um, that is a point-and-click adventure game. Um, plays just like any point-and-click, um, but in a really beautifully distilled version of that where um, every, it's not like a bunch of continuous puzzles. Uh, it's one or two room um adventure game puzzle scenarios and uh the the story of it is really great it's a this is an old game all the way back in like 2016 is when it came out originally um but this new version is just a nice update same exact experience um this guy and his is flying around in his spaceship with his robot girlfriend and someone shows up and blows them up and he's got to go to all these different planets to uh, get all the pieces to reassemble his girlfriend. <laughs> and um, it's it's fantastic. Every every level is a cute little puzzle. And uh, yeah, great game. Um, they they had an, a, a blast playing it together. So totally recommend that one. Well, that's cool. Well, um, apart from Apple Arcade, um, there have been some other things going on in the world of games and Apple that are kind of interesting. Um, I, uh, I found perplexing it very much. So very much. So, um, there's not a whole lot to say about the Apple vision pro, but maybe Shane as the resident VR liker, or at the very least, the person who owns more than one headset, which I think makes you our de facto VR expert. Um, what was your take on Apple vision pro from a gaming angle? I think, um, I don't think this is a device that's made for games. Um, I think it's made for something else, for other things, which is actually what I like best about it, why I am most interested in it. Really want to try one, really want to have one. Um, I don't think that this is going to be a machine that people make games for. Um, We'll see. The the, the biggest thing is obviously the price, um, because it's like $5 million. But um, it also just doesn't really have a lot of the things that people have figured out work for VR gaming, like controllers for each of your hands. So Mm -hmm. strange stuff. It's designed seemingly as a productivity tool, which is AR as a means of like doing various computing tasks seems really interesting to me. Um, I don't want to necessarily run down all of the things that seem uh, bizarre about this ski mask that presumably is also a camcorder. Um, but it just, you know, it seems cool and all. I probably won't <laughs> buy one because it's $4,000. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, the, the main thing is it just doesn't seem like like you're not going to be able to play any of the most popular VR games on it, like Beat Saber, because it doesn't have a controller in your hands. It's not going to track your hands while you're waving your... It seems like it's meant to track your hands when they're right in front of you and not when you're putting them above your head or behind your back or waving your arms around, right? Yeah, the so, the, the thing that, that struck me as super wild about this headset is that its its main control method is like relaxedly sort of limply dangling your hands in your lap eye tracking for pointing and then just sort of like doing little tiny pinches with your limp fingers in order to select things, which don't get me wrong. I think that's actually an incredible idea for like the kinds of like productivity and just sort of like general computing uh, use case that they're really pitching this thing on. They never, they didn't really show games on this thing at all. Um, 
so I don't think it's weird to say that this is like, you know, there's a, there's a $3,500 plus um, headset that will be the most technically impressive VR headset of all time at, when it comes out and also will be garbage for games. Um, you know, you can link an iPhone, you can link a, like a, like a con- console controller. It's the to same it. description that could be applied to every powerful Macintosh computer ever sold. Ah, so true. It's ridiculous. Um, Apple, Apple does not like games. They don't get, go ahead games. and get, get into this, uh, game porting toolkit thing, because I think that's a good, a good point to hop off of this vision pro. Cause there's not that much to say about it. Yeah. I'd there's not that much to say about it from a games perspective. It's just yeah. not going to be a game playing device. I, I do think it might be like, there might be some ways to like, you know, run a game on a big screen. Like, you know, it, there might be some benefit to that, right? Like you can pretend you have an 80 inch screen and you're sitting three feet away from it or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just not going to be a gaming device um, really at all in a few years, maybe like, you know, down the road, um, you know, version two or three or something of this, maybe. But uh, yeah, yeah, there's it's a lot of things be. that it does seem like it will be great for. But that's for another podcast to discuss. Yeah, I'm very curious about it. But from a gaming standpoint, nah. Um, but this but game recording yeah, toolkit, this was the craziest thing that they announced. Um, and as and the it wasn't a big it, loud announcement either it was no buried in with the developer stuff um and i didn't find out about it until a few days after wwdc people started to talk about this but um just uh, tell me if i've got this right because i think you probably have heard a little bit more about this than i have but it sounds like this is kind of a translation layer that will help um windows like DirectX compatible stuff uh talk to apple's um metal architecture for graphics is that about right yes but it it helps to get a little more sort of a broad picture of what's going on here so for many years there's been a project called wine if you're not familiar with that um you know it's a uh it's it's the basic technology that's at the core of um steam's proton which is the, the the software that steam offers to let people run windows games on uh, on Linux, right? Um, and one aspect of that, apart from just sort of re-implementing all of the like API calls that let a Windows app talk to Windows, um, it also re-implements the uh, the graphics API calls that let uh, a Windows app that's talking DirectX to your graphics card um, talk instead uh, in Vulkan to your graphics card on Linux. I think there's other there's other factors there that I might, you know, I'm probably oversimplifying, but you get the idea that there's like there's, you know, if you're running a computer that's running uh, Linux or Mac OS or whatever, they've got these different APIs, programming interfaces where your, um, uh, you know, your your application is, uh, you know, sending and receiving commands to the various parts of the system. Uh, they're not talking directly to the hardware. They're talking to the operating system and the graphics APIs and so on. Sure. And um, uh, so. For the last many years, uh, there's a company called um, called uh, Code Warriors. No, what's it called? Um, Code. Who who makes crossover? I forget. I'm going to check. Code is. Weavers. Code Weavers. Excuse me. So there's a company called Code Weavers that has been. Um, they've been making a, a product called Crossover that is basically the commercial version of Wine. Um, so hmm. you could today, if you want to run a Windows game on your Mac, um, download Crossover and use it to install many Windows games, especially older ones, but but many Windows games, you can install them using Crossover, and it's basically under the hood, it's Wine plus a few other special, you know, doodads. Um, it's mostly open source, but they do charge money for it as a product. Um, what Apple has done, which is really wild, is they took the open source components of Crossover, which is largely just Wine. Um, Crossover, the developers of Crossover, the the Code Weavers, are the number one developers on the open source Wine project. You know, Valve also contributes to the project. Many other uh, developers also contribute to the Wine project and have done for for like a decade plus or however long that project's been. So they're growing. straight up lifting a big chunk out of this open source tool, right? Are they um, open they're, sourcing they're... their work? They've, yeah, they've added onto it an extremely important, this is a, a crazy technical accomplishment, um, a, a, a layer to to sort of bridge the gap between that uh, for DirectX 12 games, which is the like the most modern version of DirectX that like the fanciest games are using. 
um, and bridge the gap between that and Apple's graphics API, which is called Metal. So what that actually means is that using this software, you can, uh, if you're running the very latest betas of Mac OS and you download and install this, this game porting toolkit, um, you can run uh, you know, full Windows games on your Mac and get acceptable frame rates. And it's really, really impressive. But they've released this in the most Apple and way on, imaginable. On your Mac, meaning on their latest like right. M1 and M2 chips, right? Which, what is the mm-hmm. graphics situation even? I kind of stopped paying attention. To, they don't have a dedicated graphics card. It's just on the Apple Metal M2. They, yeah, they have M1 they have a GPU, but it's part of it's all an SOC. They make, so like they have yeah. the, the the GPU is like part of the same chip essentially as the G, the the CPU and everything else. Um, but they do have GPUs. They're very impressive GPUs, but they're very optimized for um, power consumption rather than like fancy performance. So like you know a, a, a an Apple Silicon Mac can get like. 10 plus hours of battery life doing all kinds of wild shit. Um, but it's not going to compete with like, you know, an NVIDIA like 4090 or anything like that, no matter what Mac you get. Um, <clears throat> even if you get the like fanciest Apple Silicon, even you get the the brand new Mac Pro that has, that costs like $6,000 or whatever, you, uh, you're not going to get the performance that you get out of a PC graphics card. Um, but they're not that far off. And for a laptop, without its own dedicated hardware and getting incredible battery life, their GPUs are actually quite impressive. And so the ability to run modern Windows games on them um, is potentially Very kind nice. of compelling. Not everything is that com- that C- GPU intensive anyway. There's probably- Exactly, yeah. That you'd like to play. Does it cover things that are on older versions of DirectX? Like, could you only play the latest ones that are on DirectX 12 or would it also work with like 1098? 765, whatever. Well, they they kind of already did that. So like if you were running a game that was like, I don't know, DirectX 10 or whatever, I forget all the versions and and what does what. But but um if it was, you know, an older DirectX version, most of those were already covered by crossover. Um but DirectX 12 was like, you know, the 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 mm-hmm. the, the, the the Code Warriors team was like very, very excited when they and they released a big press release when like pretty recently they got like an extremely basic DirectX 12 implementation working and could run one game. Um, and it was, it was actually like, like the, the re-release of Diablo two, which uses DirectX two, uh, or DirectX 12, but is like, frankly, not exactly a graphical powerhouse. Um, Mm -hmm. so the fact that like Apple, like leapfrogged them entirely is wild and pretty impressive. But what's weird about this situation is that they did not release this as like, Here's your way to run Windows games on Macs, Mac gamers. They uh, they released this as a developer tool. Um, and here's my theory on what's happened. And, and I have I, I had an interaction on Mastodon with um, Christina Warren, who uh, works for GitHub and Microsoft, but is kind of like a like a you know Apple um, watcher um, who I think who, who like essentially confirmed this. So um, Ron. <laughs> I'm I'm now just like reading my my Mastodon feed, but here, um, Ron Gilbert, um, that Ron Gilbert had had tweeted or posted on Mastodon, like I'm confused by Apple's game porting toolkit. Is this something Windows developers need to use to make their game run on Mac? In which case, Apple will make them jump through silly hoops, sandboxing, notarization, store submission, etc., that will scare off most Windows developers. Or is this something that happens automatically? And so I said uh, in that. Uh, my suspicion is that this was originally Apple's answer to Steam's Proton, an effort to let Windows games run unmodified on Macs, um, but that the release of such a tool would only get buy-in politically within Apple uh, if they positioned it as a developer tool and part of an invitation to release on the App Store, right? And the um, so the, the most obvious use case for Game Porting Toolkit is to build it into game launchers like Steam uh, and let it just run just like Proton works. Um, and that some people at Apple may even want to do that, but can't say so for internal political reasons, right? Um, and Christina Warren kind of replied to, to my post there saying that that 100% matches what she's heard from what she she called, quote, sources close to the situation. So I consider that like, you know, 
one order off mm. from being essentially a confirmation because she has ins with lots of Apple developers and she works at Microsoft and GitHub and uh, knows all tons of Apple people. It's interesting. Um, so I think what's going on here is that somebody within Apple saw what Steam was doing with Proton and was like, we could totally do that and then did it. But how do they get this thing out the door? They've got this code. Um, they've got this, frankly, incredibly technically impressive project to be that will let people run many Steam or Windows games on their Macs at acceptable but not super impressive frame rates. But and still, so they've basically they've basically um, told this is them saying to Steam, "Hey, would you like to run all your Steam games on Apple hardware?" Um, on the most popular laptop in the universe. Would you like that? Uh, just uh, just give us 30%, right? Right. Or honestly, I think the fact that they released this as an open source project, um, there's something kind of weird about the way they did that. Like they, rather than rather than releasing it in a more standard form, they there's some really odd things about the way this code was released. Um, they released it as a single 200,000 plus line Co uh, code file like it, it's all one file um and it's like a patch for the it, rather than being a, a, something that could be easily upstreamed into wine directly they released it as a patch for the uh homebrew package manager uh release package of wine so like they they didn't even like it, it's just a, I, i'm not a developer enough to tell you like why everything about this is particularly weird but like from what I understand, they released it in a way that makes it weird, hard to use, hard to directly incorporate their work into upstream wine and uh, and you know just mm. make it more available and easy to implement elsewhere. But it is public code. They they did release the code and it can be reused. And um, crossover, or rather like the Code Weavers team, seem to have from some of their blog posts or strongly implied that they're working on import you know re-implementing what's just been released by apple into their own product which i think would probably be the ideal way for this to go um there's probably it, i think it's very very unlikely that um that like third-party game launchers like steam will incorporate this um steam apparently did some negotiation with apple many years ago to try to do something essentially proton on mac um and apple kind of was like sure go for it but steam wanted some assurances that like if they did all the work to implement this thing and to be able to allow their games to run on max that like apple they wouldn't would continue like, pull to the be rug out from under them there. yeah right mm -hmm. and um and apple won't do that and so steam wouldn't put in the development resources to do it rightfully so i think so um you know somebody like the crossover team they, they're selling a product that's like you know buy our thing to use it to run your game um i think they have a little more like reason to do it but anyway i it's already in use like you can go on reddit right now on some of the mac gaming subreddits and there are people who have um, already even done things like build little apps to like install this for you and like make the whole process a little easier and there's like people making databases of what games work and don't work and get what performance on what yeah. chips so it's uh it's it's fully out there now um still right now you have to be on beta software um so it's, it's, I mean, not... it's out there it's out there in a form that like means nothing to actual gamers like it, it this is right this is a non this is non-news because there's no there's no game i can go and download right no. now but in a few years i think this will be a big deal um or even in one year like honestly when when the next version of mac os comes out um i think this is basically going to mean like it's it, it's going to make um people with mac laptops be able to run fancy games at kind of okay frame rates um and pretty well all right so the last thing i really wanted to make sure we talked about because in the past we have like we said identified um or dedicated i should say a in the past we've dedicated a few episodes to the adas but they're kind of a not real gaming award um in the world you know they're not there's there's gaming awards and then there's the Apple developer awards that also always have some sort of way of touching on games. We used to enjoy doing them because it was often a kind of a way to like 
have a lens on what Apple considered the most interesting games of the year on their platform. And there was a time when interesting and new games were coming out on iPhones all the time. Um, and it was sort of a, a you know, a place where indie developers were, were focusing a lot of attention. Um, and so back then we did a lot of episodes on the ADAs and we kind of fell off of doing mm -hmm. that because they stopped being interesting. You know, the, uh, the games that were getting awarded were boring. It's also, I think kind of inherently a less interesting now that Apple is a games publisher so much with yeah. their own games service. So it's hard to say like, well, is this just going to be the year where they pick everything that they like that did well on their own platform, on their own service within their own, like, you know, things that they have a lot of control over in the first place. That said this year, I think I like the way they did the ADAs a lot. The, instead of mm -hmm. doing gaming categories, um, they've kind of shuffled up how they do the categories. They did categories for inclusivity, um, did light and fun interaction, social impact, visuals and graphics and innovation, which, right, you know, it, it's those are interesting categories. I get what they're going for. But the thing that they did was they put in um, they put in a gaming and non gaming winner kind of by identify. They, they don't really have a gaming category. They just have des different kind of design concepts that they like. And they just happen to have chosen one game and one non game for each of these. So I kind of think that's interesting. But there's a few games on here that I have spent time with and am really enjoying. And so it's kind of worth it to, to dive in a little bit. Yeah. In fact, one, one that we, I mean, not to go out of order completely, but one that we did an entire mm -hmm. episode on, um, yeah. in their delight and fun category, which I think is a kind of a weird category for this to fall into. Um, they, they it's awarded, in there with Duolingo. By yeah. The way. I was going to say Duolingo and after place by Evan Keese and after place is the most incredible, a uh, phone game I have played in years and we did a whole episode on it. It is a, um, uh, like a, uh, it, it's a, it's a, you know, pixel art, um, action RPG mm -hmm. with an involved and interesting plot that is played entirely with swipes on a vertically oriented cell phone. Um, and, uh, they, they list finalists. It, it went up against pocket card jockey, not words and chantlings, uh, and cream, which I don't know what that is. And, um, and it, you know, I think it was an, it, whoever was picking things here. Like, I think they did a, they did a good thing here because it, uh, after place is an absolutely incredible game. Um, go listen to our episode. I talk a lot of sugar about it. Um, it but wasn't it's, really up against cream. Cream is a, um, cooking instruction app. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Um, I don't know what chantlings <laughs> is. is either, That's but. why these categories are so weird. It's like, yes, <laughs> congratulations to Duolingo and after place. But I think it basically got this award because this is one of the only like full game ass games that I have uh -huh. played in a long time that was designed first and foremost for phones. It's also yeah. on Android. And very nice. um, so, yeah, I can see why they went with with this option in that like, hey, this is an incredible game. Um, but it's also kind of surprising because it doesn't really feel like an Apple game like this came out on uh, iPhones and Androids, I believe, simultaneously. And it's not like using any special Apple technologies or anything like that. This is just uh, a good but it game. It also for feels phones. like it couldn't be on anything else, right? Which That's is true. Yeah. Which is it, what, the interesting thing about the game in terms of its design, really, is that it has the look and the kind of game language of retro action RPGs. But yeah, it does or also like in contemporary a, indie like games. a perfect mobile. Yeah. And, and it does that with a per, like a perfectly mobile native feeling game. It doesn't like a lot of those feel like it's, you know, has has some kind of fake touchscreen buttons or something like that. it just it's just a great phone game. Totally. Uh, but I, I think also phone game ass phone game won in the uh, interaction winners. I really do not know why this game won. <laughs> I am I am I am perplexed. Railbound um is a puzzle game that you know it's it's just a railroad puzzle game. Like I I don't know if I I feel like if you if I were to tell you that you are going to be playing a game on your phone where you um drag pieces of railroad uh train 
lines around so that you can line up the train cars um, in numerical order, you already have uh, in your mind exactly the game that rail <laughs> Railbound is. Uh, it is, you know, you tap and you drag and you lay the tracks and then you tell the trains to go and, you know, you have to line the tracks up so that they end up in the correct facing and order and all line up behind the engine. And you do that like a million times. Um, <laughs> it, somehow it's compelling. Uh, maybe it's the, um, you know, nice animation. Th th this is a game where um, the ba the best thing that I can say about it is that the instant I tapped the icon for the very first time I was playing the game, like there was no long loading screen there was no like, hey, welcome, we're Afterburn. Um, you know, we used FMOD for the sound. Here's some trailers. Here's the name of the guy that made it. Um, nope, you tap on the icon and bam, you are you are solving train puzzles immediately. I almost bought this game on Steam, but I actually think it's probably better for phones. Like this, mm -hmm. uh, th this is this is definitely my kind of thing. I don't play a ton of puzzle games, but I. I do kind of have a weird soft spot for trains, not like, not like train oh, spotting. You're gonna love like, this, yeah. But I love train yeah. games. I would love it if you would play this because I am stuck. Um, I, I don't have my phone with me. Uh, I am, but I am. I have gotten to the point where, um, I've had to really start making some loop de loops to adjust the timing for when the trains arrive behind the engine, and. Uh, I I have started to get to places where you have to set off switches to open and close various gates. And I I just I can get maybe one of these done a day and it looks like there's a million <laughs> levels. Well, I just bought it, so I'll uh, I'll let you know how I get on. All right. Uh there are a few other games that made it. Uh that one by the way was up against games that I had never heard of in that category. Things like Automa Toys and Kimono Cats. So those sound Kimono great. Cats looks really cute. It's on Apple Arcade I and mean, it's kind of like yeah. a um, well, yes, we are discussing Apple Arcade, but it's cute. <laughs> I think I think there are some games on here like Social Impact. Interesting one. They picked Endling, which I have seen on several other platforms and it's seems nice. It's a little um, platformer where you're a fox with some babies. And there's yeah, I played a bit of that on Steam as well, and mm -hmm. I liked it quite a bit. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I suppose, you know, for games for so or um, you know, for social impact, I guess something that's got an ecological message counts. But um, I I was kind of most surprised by the fact that Resident Evil Village was on here. Mm -hmm. um, Resident Evil Village, I played on PC, uh, but for 40 bucks, you can play it on your Mac. And it looks like it looks pretty good, at least from the screenshots. I have no idea what it looks like in motion. Uh, well, but I can I can say that's a damn fine, scary ass game. And uh, <laughs> there is a it's it is it is one of my favorite games that we have covered for the I think I put it high on our list for for the year, at least it was it's a great uh, action horror game, uh, survival horror, some great stuff. Uh, Vampire Mom is very large, big hat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is the game that like Apple continues to use when they want to like make a vague effort at saying that, you know, Max can play games um, because Capcom apparently did quite a creditable port of this to to metal to which is you know, Apple's graphics API. Um, so apparently this runs really well on Mac laptops, which, hey, I mean, if you've got an Apple Silicon laptop, that's pretty cool that it does. Um, but it's also like not exactly a brand new game. And uh, it's like one game. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's very few like AAA games that you know can make this claim. So of course they gave the, an award for graphics because yeah, it's they're like, using a they're using Apple's metal upscaling feature on here. Yeah, you, you this does look like it looks really really good on a on a mm -hmm. Mac laptop. Yeah. Um, and I guess the last thing on the list was Marvel Snap, which I haven't played at all. Shane, have you? I specifically avoided playing Marvel Snap uh, because I don't need another one of these in my life. Uh, but I'm very tempted to, to do it. it. Marvel Snap is a digital collectible card game um, where all the Marvel heroes and villains are represented on cards. Um, and 
it is a uh, very fast playing um, like deck building game, right? So very much like Magic the Gathering. You can ring the bell, Reagan. Yeah, so it's just that. Uh, but there are some interesting things that it does, uh, like cool parallax 3D graphics on the cards. You know, they look kind of 3D when you drag them around. Um, and on top of that, I can say uh, it seems like it has a fairly not annoying um, monetization model for something like this. Uh, but that is coming from someone who has been uh, completely suckered by Magic the Gathering out of so much money uh, that anything else looks cheap <laughs> by comparison. It seems like this game has had legs. People do seem to like it. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, looks, that's great, it's, I guess. It's great. Uh, it has this thing I really like where they're they like week by week, I guess, or maybe different cues or something. They switch out some of the um, locations like that. Every game takes place across three different lanes and you're playing your cards into one of the three different lanes. And there are um, special like events and places that show up as those lanes that affect the rules, which seems cool. Like, um, you know, it kind of keeps keeps things in the you know mixing up the the meta game by actually changing um the terrain uh, uh that you're playing on rather than the card pool very interesting way to run a game like this not gonna play it but um yeah glad me either because i that... uh i would like to <laughs> i would like to tell you reagan gamers i found a reagan kelly um uh artifact uh when cleaning out a storage unit recently and that is <laughs> a uh deck of car a magic deck that Reagan made, um, it was the last deck you made, Reagan. I don't know when that might have been, but that would have been um, before the age of 16, at least, because we moved out of the house and packed that stuff up then. I can tell you that it was definitely before our house flooded. So it would have been in probably the mm -hmm. year 2000 yeah, or maybe yeah. so it would have certain, been... like very early 2001. Mm -hmm. And it is in a, uh, I found it in, a Tempest MTG um, uh, booster box, right? They used to sell rather. Now they only sell the cards in packs. Back then you would get a, what is called a starter deck, which would come in a paper box, which was a, um, you know, you, you would keep those. So that would have been a 1997 product. So I don't know. It's huh. somewhere in the, in that era. Right. And um, so you had made a deck that upon reflection shows that you were a child of very poor moral character, Reagan, because <laughs> um, this deck contains um, five copies. By the way, four is the legal maximum. Five copies <laughs> of Diabolic Edict, um, a card that um, is absolutely horrible because it it forces your opponent to uh, sacrifice a creature, right? And for uh, which, and you also had like four counter spells in there. Um, it was a blue black control deck, uh, that in inexplicably also ran uh, a bunch of rats and reanimation spells. So, um, I, I, I guarantee you, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I, on, I, I fly, I think you did, Rick. <laughs> I think you did because at the time I was playing, uh, uh, mostly like uh, white weenie kind of decks where you would have just a bunch of small white creatures uh, with flying and stuff like that. And your deck was basically designed uh, to turn that deck off by not letting any creatures hit the board, which produced, <laughs> you know, or stay on the board for more than one turn long enough to attack, which made it um, terrible to play against. I I'm sure I made you real mad with that one. I don't remember that at looking all. Looking back through this deck. Anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that's the kind of gamer Reagan was uh, in, in that era. He, he would um, exploit any weakness that he could find uh, and waste your time with counter spells. So only we, only with you, Shane, only with mm -hmm. you, only with you ruthless. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, as Richard Garfield intended. Well, this was fun. Um, I'm glad that we uh, had a chance to talk about all of the, the latest Apple stuff. And mm -hmm. listeners, if you've got uh, phone games that you think we're missing out on because of our anti-phone biases, uh, we'd love to hear about them.
We don't play a ton of mobile games, but occasionally we get recommendations like we did from a random Twitter person who told me to play After Place that was a total absolute banger. And uh, honestly, I should probably be doing more phone games because, you know, mm-hmm. the life I'm leading, I've got probably more time where I could be playing them. Uh, yeah, I love I'm phone not. games, man. Yeah. I I think I think that we could do a whole if we if we try and sort through it together, especially if we get some of our more puzzle savvy co-hosts to help us out when the train tracks crisscross in the wrong way, I think mm-hmm. we could do a whole episode on the the little uh, dog railroad game. It is a good puzzle. I've just downloaded it. I'm looking forward to checking it out. So maybe so. Um, anyway, uh, listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Uh, you can find us on the internet at shortgame.fm, which is just a little one pager where you can see links to all of our stuff. There's a link to our show notes page where you can search and find uh, all of our back catalog episodes if you want. Um, there's links to subscribe to the show on all the various podcast platforms. Listener, have you left a review? for the short game podcast on your podcast platform of choice. You have, have you listener? Why not? Well, maybe you should do that. Uh, we really appreciate reviews. They're the number one way to boost us in the algorithm that we assume governs our lives. So uh, please do that. Um, but also if you want to support the show, the number one way to do that is via Patreon. There's a link on our short game.fm page or it's patreon.com slash the short game. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. Um, I, we really appreciate all of our patrons, uh, and every patron at any level gets instant access to our discord community, which is, uh, our, the place where we plan the show. We talk about games that we're playing. We have channels for discussing non-short games for recommending games. Uh, it's just a great place to come hang out. Uh, we really appreciate you. And you can find me on Mastodon at Reagan, R-A-Y-G-A-N at bird.rodeo. Uh, and Shane, where can people find you? You can find me on Mastodon at 8bitshane at mstdn.social. And I'm on Twitter at 8bitshane. And listeners, thank you once again for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. <laughs>